Now we're going to move to the lingual posterior crossbite. For each maxillary posterior tooth where the maxillary buccal cusp is lingual to the buccal cusp tip of the opposing mandibular tooth from the first premolar to the third molar, one point is scored. Let us look at the um, right side of the first and there is a lingual posterior cross spike up between the second molars here, kind of end to end. So this will score one point. We turn it to the, whoa, it's hard to hold, to the left side. Here we have three teeth in lingual cross spike. With the second premolar, first molar, and second molar, which is three points. The right and left total would be four points for this category. Now I'm going to cease measurement of this D1, DI1 and I'm going to use another set of casts to demonstrate additional information. This set of casts is DI2 which has a shallow and sizer relationship. So let's return to that overjet category we covered at the very beginning to discuss the negative overjet aspect of the category. In fact, this cast has the maxillary right lateral incisor in cross bite with the mandibular teeth. If I measure the amount of cross bite from the facial of the maxillary lateral to the edge of the mandibular canine, I obtain a reading of two millimeters, which scores two points on the negative overjet. When we look at the rest of the anteriors, we see an end-to-end -end horizontal relationship, which score one point under the cat uh, overjet category. So this case would score a total of one, two, three points under overjet for the negative uh, relationship. Now if we look in the vertical plane for the anterior open bite category, both the centrals and the left lateral incisor are end to end and receive one point each to total three points for this category. These facially positioned canines are an example of the blocked out tooth which would not be scored in this category. The previous two cases have allowed us to look at various aspects of the overjet and anterior open bite categories. Now this next set of casts is DI4 and I wish to show you and demonstrate the buccal posterior cross bite which is the only remaining category for initial cast analysis that we've not discussed. For each maxillary posterior tooth from the first premolar to the third molar, in complete buccal crossbite, two points are scored. Now this cast demonstrates actually three incidents of buc buccal posterior crossbite. And if you look at the right side, the right second molars and the right first premolars uh, are both in buccal crossbite. And if we turn to the left side, we can see the left second molars are in total buccal cross bite. So that's two, four, six total points for buccal cross bite. This cast also demonstrates the impinging on palatal tissues. And I don't know whether you can see that or not uh, on the cast with the lighting, but uh, they are touching up there. Plus it is a hundred percent vertical overbite. So this is where you would score five points. Uh, frequently as we all know division two cases will demonstrate this. Now we've gone through eight categories that measure complexity of the dental malocclusion as seen on the pretreatment casts. Let us move to the cephalometrics category. 
if we look on the DI form, this category measures three entities, A and B, S in the mandibular plane, and the angle of lower incisor to mandibular plane. The first measurement is the A and B angle. Now here is an example case that I've already uh, traced and placed the constructs of the selenasion, the N to A, point N to B, menton to constructed gonion, and the long axis of the most prominent incisor to mandibular plane. Now there are instructions on the ABO website explaining how to arrive at the constructed gonion point, which is utilized along with menton uh, to uh, determine the mandibular plane angle, or the, the plane. Remember that the midpoints between the right and left borders of the mandible are used, not an individual side. Now I'm going to use uh, the convenient cephalometric protractor to make my uh, measurements here. And uh, if we look at SNA, we come up with 86 and move it to SNB and it is uh, 78. So if you subtract that, you get eight degrees. Normally what I'll do is I'll put eight degrees over on the form here. Now, we're going to divide that up uh, four point or, or um, six degrees of that up to six would give us four points. Um, then that leaves two degrees at one point each. So that would equal two more points. Um, so that would equal, in essence, six degrees uh, or, or um, uh, six points uh, for the A and B angle. Now let's measure the next entity in the category, which is the mandibular to SN plane. I'm going to turn the protractor around and uh, place one of the parallel lines on the mandibular plane and run it to the SN. And um, it, it reads uh, close. It's 35 degrees. So um, when I measure that, that is does not meet the limit, the limit of 38 degrees equal to or greater than. So in this particular entity, there is no score. The last entity to measure is the lower incisor to mandibular plane. So I will place that along the mandibular plane and move the line to the, uh, through the incisor. And I come up with 105 degrees. When I refer to the DI, it needs to be equal to or greater than 99 degrees. And so that score, it is, and so it's scored as one point. And for, uh, if we subtract 99 from 105, you come up with six degrees. You would add six points, and that is placed on the form. So we have six degrees times one point, and it's six points. So you add all this up, and you come up for this particular uh, case, 13 uh, points from this uh, cephalometric category. Now we move to the final category for the DI form, which is the other category. There are definitions for each of the specific other entities, and I won't spend time reading each one but I will comment about three of the entities that have sometimes been confusing. The missing teeth entity has two aspects. If the permanent teeth are missing because they did not develop, they receive two points per tooth. If the permanent tooth is missing for some other reason, all except the third molars, of course. For example, uh, if they've been extracted due to caries, uh, traumatic evulsion, or perhaps the teeth are removed to create space for orthodontic purposes. All these would be scored as one point that has sometimes been misinterpreted. The other area is spacing here. It too has two aspects. 
two points are awarded for maxillary central diastema and two points uh, for uh, generalized spacing. Now, here is a case, as you can see, that has generalized spacing. Uh, in the maxillary arch, the generalized spacing, spacing between the six anterior teeth, that means that arch would receive two points. When we look at the mandibular, ar mandibular arch, there are six spaces with eight teeth involved, yet only two points gain uh, are gained for that arch. So the total of points for this generalized spacing case is four points, two for each arch. If the maxillary central diastema uh, had been uh, two millimeters, then an additional two points would have been scored. In this particular case, quite frankly, when I measured it, it just measured just below uh, two millimeters. So um, a little bit more than it would have been counted also. Here is a visual of spacing examples that may help to clarify. The final other entity uh, to consider is the additional treatment complexities, which are two points each, but you must identify on the lines provided. This has also created some confusion and attempts to use factors and situations that might arguably influence the difficulty of the case, but that might not be a specific complexity of the malocclusion. Remember that the examiners will make the ultimate decision on whatever you might place in additional treatment complexity category and which, whether it is acceptable item. For example, if you uh, have a total of 20 for the DI and yet two of those points are from the additional treatment complexity entity, you are running the risk that the item that you've placed there may not be acceptable to the examiners. Thus, the 20 points then become 18, and that's not allowed, and all of a sudden the case you've just brought will no longer meet the category of the criteria for that case presentation. So be cautious about that. This is the end of the discrepancy index demonstration. I hope that it has been helpful. Uh, you can now move to the CAST radiographic evaluation form in the second part of the demonstration. Thank you for your kind attention. Disclosure. The ABO continually evaluates the measurement instruments and makes changes in the instructions. Those alterations are posted on the ABO website. Always double check for any recent changes. This demonstration was originally recorded in the spring of 2011.